a week ago Sunday, and the week before that, I've talked on this uh, same scripture here, and I'm going to continue going on in this vein, okay? Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we have been made right with God through Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Amen. Let's go to the Lord and ask Him to speak to our hearts tonight. Jesus, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege to share the word tonight, and we just pray, God, that you're going to touch every heart, every mind. God, we know that the word is powerful, and we just let the word do its work tonight in our hearts and in our lives. We love you, Lord. We are nothing without your touch. We come to bring you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Give honor to our pastor tonight and Sister Amy and thankful for the great pastor that we have and um, the way he is used not only um, here locally but around our um, UPC, um, the whole area and also overseas and so much that he does and we're just thankful for his vision, amen, and for what we're go uh, what's going on here at the church. Also, Give honor tonight to Bishop, amen, it's always a little intimidating to have to teach in front of Bishop, because he's the, he is the teacher extraordinaire, but it's also very comforting having Bishop in service with us, amen. So we're thankful for the Bishop and Dr. Myers and, and what God has just given us here at um, East Wind. All right, so in this portion of Scripture, so here's how our troubles work, if you'll let it. It says, our troubles worketh, amen. So if you let it work, our troubles, we have troubles. How many, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many's got troubles? We all got troubles, amen. Troubles worketh this patience, this enduring or this waiting time and Patient worketh experience. So this is the third lesson I'm teaching on that. So I'm going to send her on the experience, which simply is to prove or to prove to be trustworthy and just simply the proof. In other words, the proof is in the pudding. Amen. The proof is what God does in our lives. And we, and in that in turn, it works hope within us, which is the anticipation of what God's glory is going to be revealed unto us. And so this experience is uh, very important for us in our lives, and it's why we can sing the song like, you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. Amen? So we can sing that, and we can get excited about that, because each and every one of us have individual experiences with God. And we know where God has brought us from. And we know that the troubles that he's brought us through. Amen. So you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. And you see somebody worshiping and you see somebody praising and uh, you can think, well, they're gone a little crazy tonight. Well, you don't know what God has done for us. Amen. They get crazy at the ball fields and they get crazy at the concerts and I'm thankful that we get crazy for the Lord in our worship and in our praise. It's through these experiences that we have hope or to anticipate. We have this anticipation that makes this whole circle and it goes in a circle. And we have hope and we have troubles again and, and we have that patience and we have the experience that gives us hope. And so it kind of does this rotation in our lives. Amen. So we know and we realize 
beforehand this hope or this anticipation. We can foresee. In other words, you should not be surprised. Amen. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 12 it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Okay, so you're going to have a fiery trial, and it is going to try you. As though some strange thing has happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So he says, you know, rejoice in your situation. As we all go through it, we are going to, all, all going to go through it. But we know that his glory is going to be revealed to us someday. Amen. There's going to be a revelation of his power in that day that you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Amen. Reminds me of another song. It's going to be worth it all. You know that song? It's going to be worth it all. Every long mile, every heartache and every trial or something like that. Amen. You got to say every long mile. I mean, he's been on a long mile, amen? But he says rejoice and be exceedingly glad because it is going to be worth it all, amen? We need to get our eyes on the Lord and what he's doing. You know, we hear a lot about, oh, the world's in bad shape and the world is really going down and the world's doing this and the world's doing that and the Antichrist is knocking at the door and, and all that's true. It's the word of God. Amen? But God says where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Amen? And we see all these things come about. He says, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. We don't need to have our eyes on this world. Amen? And what's going on in this world, we need to have our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and to realize that he's doing a work in these ending days. And it's an exciting time to be a part of the church because there's going to be revival in the land. Amen. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound, and this is Paul speaking again, to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth. So we know that this... Uh, troubles that build upon us, they are increasing our faith. We, we grow in faith through the Word of God, and we grow in faith by just simply plugging along. Amen? Staying in the fight, staying in the battle. But he says that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each one to another. Amen? This is what the Bible says. It's what speaks to the heart of the world, the love. And when we go through these situations and these growth, it should make us less judgmental. Amen? Because you don't know what it takes for somebody just to come into the house of God. You don't know what they're going through in their life. You don't know all these situations and issues in life. And I don't know, I've, I've experienced this myself. I won't give the details of it, but I experienced this before being very judgmental of somebody in a situation, and then not long after I find myself in that situation. And God really can work you over. Amen? So we have these, I believe, these troubles and trials and situations in our life so that we can grow in our faith, that we become more compassionate to our fellow believers, our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We have more love and compassion, and not only that, but we view the world, the field, the harvest field out there with more love and compassion. Amen? What the church needs more of is compassion. I'm, I'm convinced of it. We need to realize that there's so much hurt going on out there. Amen? And the church is the one that needs to be reaching out. But he says, your love toward each other. Paul was saying, I thank God because you're growing in your faith and in your love and toward each other abund, uh, aboundeth. Your love toward each other is abounding. Amen. It's growing and growing. And that's where we need to be. Don't just be somebody that comes in 
to the house of God and goes out and just comes to church on the church times and goes out. Get involved in the church. Get involved with your brothers and sisters. Love one another. And the Bible tells us, you know, the, to not uh, forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And, but so much the more we should do it as we see that day approaching. Come to the house of God. Love your brothers. Amen. Bring people into the house of God, and God will bless us. Amen. He said you, your love is abounding one towards another. Verse 4, so that we always ourselves glory, glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So here, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 4, it's kind of repeated again right, <clears throat> right there. It goes, it's not an exact wording, but at the same time, your patience, your endurance, and your faith has showed through your troubles and that you endure. Amen. Which is a manifest token, verse 5, of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. So God's preparing us. He's trying to do a work in us. Amen. And we see all these things, and it's the manifest. It's something that's made manifest to us, token of the righteous judgment of God. When we look at David and take for an example David, <clears throat> as a shepherd boy, he was just a little shepherd boy. And the Bible says that uh, one time a lion came after his sheep and he went out and re received the lion or received the lamb back from the lion. And also the same thing happened with a bear. And he went out and retrieved that um, lamb from the bear. And so when we think about that, we just kind of read over it, but, but that was trouble right there. <laughs> that was some tribulations. That was some problems. Amen. Something was coming against his livelihood, his, his flock, something that he was supposed to be protecting, this lion and this bear. And through the power of God, he was able to ret retrieve those um, lambs out of the mouth of the enemy. And then we find him going down and fighting Goliath, right? And how did he have the faith to fight Goliath? It tells us in 1 Samuel 17, 37, And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And, Paul, and Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Amen. So here David was able, as he saw Goliath, because of some past problem or trouble or situation that he had come through, and God had given him an experience, proof that God was with him. Amen? Do you understand what I'm saying? Your troubles from yesterday are to increase your faith for the giant that you're going to face tomorrow. And nothing is too big for the church because our God is bigger than anything. Our God is all-powerful. You don't need to be fear fearful. You don't need to be afraid, amen, because our God has everything in control, amen. doesn't matter what the world looks like. God's got a plan, and the world's in that plan. God's in control. God is not nervous, right? God's not upset. God's not up there wondering, I wonder what I'm going to do about this and about that, God knows, and all we got to do is stay in the vein, amen, and to realize that this world, and we're going to have the tribulations, we're going to have the problems and the troubles, and that we don't need to be fretful about those things, but we just realize that we are just strangers and pilgrims passing through this old world. Don't get attached to this world. That's when you start looking on the problems and the situations, amen. So then even on uh, David, after he had defeated uh, Goliath, that was a great thing. But even then, he had to fight Saul on his way to the kingship, if you will. But David had to overcome Saul. And David, had, through his life and through his experience, he had 
develop some integrity in his life. And he said, I, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. And even though Saul was coming against him and trying to kill David, David was running. And you read all of that. You know, David had a physical anointing, right? Sometimes we have thoughts in our minds and or dreams in our minds or whatever. But David had the prophet come and anoint him with oil and tell him he'd be the next king of Israel. And you got to think, you know, it was years later before he ever took the throne, you got to think uh, that David said, well, maybe Samuel had it all wrong. Maybe the prophet was off, off key, don't you think? Wouldn't we be? Sometimes we get that way. But he had this physical uh, thing that he had given to him, and still he had it. It wasn't just a thought that he had in his mind. It wasn't just a hope that he had, but he had something tangible, if you will, that he was able to see and hear, but yet he still had to go through these situations. We also have the example of Joseph. You think about Joseph, and he was sold by his family. His own brothers sold him into slavery. He was lied on once he got to uh, Egypt. He was in Potiphar's house. Things were going a little bit better. He got uh, bought by a pretty good master, and so he was doing good there. And then he got lied on while he was at Potiphar's house and got sent to prison. So these were all things. And, and the interesting thing that I thought when I was looking over this is that while he was in prison, these got two guys come to him, the baker and the butler, I believe it was, came to him and said, we have a dream. I thought about this. I thought about David might say, well, or I mean, um, Joseph, sorry. Joseph might say, well, I'm not too much on dreams. I had a dream one time, and it didn't, it didn't turn out too good. You know what I'm saying? And so you think about the dream, but he still believed in dreams. And even after he interpreted the dream for uh, these, the butler and the baker, you know, he was forgot about in prison. He told the butler, I believe it was, the one that got reinstated, he said, don't forget about me when I'm here. And I think the Bible says two years went by, and guess what? Somebody else had a dream. But Joseph still believed in a dream. Amen. He didn't have that audible, tangible voice like David had, right, with the, with the um, prophet coming and anointing him. He only had a dream. Amen. And sometimes in the, our lives we have dreams and we feel that they were given to us by God. And I'm just here tonight to tell you to hold on to your dream. Hold on to your dream. Don't push this aside. Amen. Don't push God aside because it hasn't turned out the way that you anticipated this all turning out. God's got a plan. The Bible says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. And we need to allow him to be that author. We want to take some pages of that book out and we want to skip some of the uh, chapters that he may want to be in there. But we just need to allow God to finish our faith. Amen. Continue with your dream. And then he finally got to the, the throne and his dream was, was revealed. Amen. Second Thessalonians says this, it's, we already read it up there, but it says, for your patience and faith in all your per persecutions and tribulations that you endure. All of these things are a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy, hallelujah, for the kingdom of God. You know that they say, and I, real, I don't know who they are, <laughs> But I heard, I heard these uh, statistics. So they say that certain percent of statistics aren't any good either. But these are interesting, so I'm just going to read them to you. They say 40% of what we worry about never happens. We can worry ourselves over our problems and our situation. 40% of those things never happen. They say 30% 
of our worries are things from the past that we can't do anything about anyway. You can't relive the past. You can't go back and redo the past. Paul said, this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind, and I reach forth. Amen. We need to reach forward. Don't look behind. Amen. With regret. Don't worry about yesterday. It's gone. You can't do anything about it. But today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Amen. And they say that 12% of our, what we worry about is our health, which ironically hurts our health. To worry about your health hurts your health. Amen. So leaves about 18% left of some things that might be legitimate things to worry about. Amen. But he says, just cast all your cares upon the Lord. Cast them unto me, he says. I want your cares. I want your heavy burdens. All you that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me, he says. Let him have it. Amen. And I know that's easier said than done. We also have <clears throat> this great example of Paul in his, his life, his trouble, his patience, and his experience. And I want to read this, and probably most everybody's familiar with, but in Acts 27, verse 20. <clears throat> I just want to read. I've, I've uh, tried to cut out as many verses as I could so that we're not reading the whole thing. But Paul is being sent to Rome. He's a prisoner of Rome now. And he's bound and he's being taken there on a ship. And the ship gets into a storm. All right, It's a bad storm. They're in this storm. Hurricane, if you will. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. So they were just thought this is it. This is the end of this. And well, we're not going to make it. All hope was gone. Paul's writing this. But after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. That abstinence meant fasting. After a fasting, a long fasting, he stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. So I guess they were at a certain port. Paul told them, don't go. I don't feel good about it. They didn't listen to him. He was just a prisoner. And here's, here he's saying, I told you so. You should have listened to me. But now you need to hearken to me now. Verse 22, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer. And it's interesting in all of these, you know, when you read about troubles and trials and tribulations, a lot of times it talks about being joyful, be of good cheer. <laughs> and that's the last thing you want to be is joyful and full of good cheer, right? When you're going through it. But he says, be of good cheer. Here they were in the midst of the storm still. And there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve. So Paul was able to say, I believe this because I serve this God. I've seen him move in times past, saying, fear not, this is what the angel said, said, fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. So verse 24 is the purpose. God's reminding Paul, you're my child. You've got a purpose in your life, and nothing's going to stop it. I say nothing's going to stop it. The purpose God has for your life, all of hell cannot prevail against the church of the living God. Amen? The devil cannot stop it. And the devil will try to uh, intimidate you for sure and say, no, it's never going to happen. You know, God's not with you. Look at all the trouble that you've either gotten yourself into yourself or that's come along the way. God's not with you. But these are examples I'm trying to point out. The troubles do not determine whether you're living right with God or not. 
It says, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must cast upon a certain island. And then let's just go to Acts 28, verse 1. So they're in this storm. Paul gets a visitation from the Lord, tells him what's going to happen. And he tells the people, we're going to crash on this island. And they go through the process, and that's exactly what happens. Verse 1 of chapter 28, and when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And so when, when they escaped, just meant simply they made it safely to the island. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, or the people that lived on the island were very kind to them. For they kindled a fire and received us everyone because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened onto his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no, ma no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. Verse 5, but he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. And they looked, all the, game, all the people out there, they were just looking, watching, waiting for him to keel over dead. It said, howbeit when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds. They said, oh, he must be a god. This is a god. In the same quarters were possess, uh, possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us there certain uh, three days uh, courteously. And it came to pass that, after, that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in, prayed, laid his hands on him, and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when they departed, they laid in us with such things as were necessary. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the island, whose sign was Castor and Pollock. And so here is, I was, the three things that we are, had, the troubles that we have, and then it leads to work as patient and patient experience. So as you look at Paul, he was a prisoner, right? Paul was a prisoner. This was his trouble. He was in a storm for at least two weeks, and then he was shipwrecked. And then he got bit by a poisonous snake. I would say that Paul had a little bit of trouble. Amen. Uh, our storms around, it said that it lasted 14 days, I think it was, that this storm lasted. That's a long time to be in a storm on a ship. I don't think I could handle that. I would have died of six, seasickness first, I think. I can remember when I was about 16, I went on a little charter boat out into the ocean, and uh, the, the waves weren't even big. They said they're only three to five feet, but that constant swell, you know, you're on that boat if you've ever been in that. That's not for me. And uh, I promised the Lord, and I wasn't even in church yet, that I would never go out on one of those charter fishing if he would get me to land. We were out there. We couldn't see land. And so that's kind of weird, you know. And then finally I could see land. I started feeling a little bit better. But I can say today I've kept my promise, never went on a so I don't even like fishing anyway. So, But they were out there for two weeks. That's a long time. Amen. He was, all hope was gone is what he said. He's included in that. All hope was gone until he had the visitation. And then he gets off. Finally they made it and he gets bit by a poisonous snake. That was his trouble. His patience, though, he never considered himself a prisoner of Rome. 
he always considered himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And that's something good for us to remember. When you're in your troubles, when you're, you just say, well, I'm just an ambassador of you, Lord. So wherever you take me, I know you're with me. After a long abstinence, this is his patience, he fasted. It was that patient time. He was trying to do everything he could. He endured the judgment of the people. They were all looking on him, you know, he, he must be a murderer. And then they changed their mind, and they looked at him for a long time, you know, and, and judging him and everything. And then finally, you know, when he shook it off into the fire, they changed their minds. And the third thing, experience, is what we're talking about really here tonight, is experience, divine demonstration. Have you ever had God move in your life for you? You have that demonstrating power of Almighty God. He survived the shipwreck, plus all the men that were with him, 279 men. Amen. He had a visitation from God. He had a physical visitation from an angel of the Lord. And he also had revival on the island. He was able to heal people, lay hands on them and heal them. And you know that he was there for three months. Amen. So we know that he had church during those times. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he, God, said unto me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. Amen. No matter where you are, no matter what your situation, God is speaking to us tonight, letting us know that his grace is sufficient. We have access to this grace. Amen. We don't have to go to a pastor or we don't have to go to a bishop to say, hey, could you talk to God for me? We can have access into this. We can go boldly into the presence of God. He's that ever-present help in the time of need. He said, my grace is sufficient unto thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly then, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He was talking also about this infirmity, this thorn in the flesh that he had. This is what is in the previous verses, I think. <clears throat> But in verse 10, it says, Therefore I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. Amen. Take pleasure in them. All these words are just really interesting to me as you read them and think upon them. It says we're supposed to take pleasure in these things. It's because it's breaking down this old flesh that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He said, I glory, I rejoice in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me, and I take pleasure in all these things, infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecution, and uh, distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. You may feel like you've been beat down. You may feel like you're a little... Um, overwhelmed with your situations, but I want you to know that when you're weak in the Lord, you're strong. Amen. Now, if it's your own fault and you work through it, still come to the altar, amen, of sacrifice. But if you're just trying to live for God the best you can and you're going through these things, I want you to know that God is made manifest through your life. People are watching your lives, and we've all had this before. They said, how do you do it? How do you stay happy? You know, when I know the things that you're going through, it's because we have a God. Hallelujah. That's there. And it's showing us his hand through all of our situations. <clears throat> Perfect or mature, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 19 says, For the law made nothing perfect. The Old Testament made nothing perfect. It was just a series of do's and don'ts. But the bringing in of a better hope did. The law back there and all the situations of, of the law. But bringing in a better hope did. By the which we draw nigh unto God. 
So if you look at the law and you realize, and this is what Jesus faced when he was walking on the earth, if you were in trouble, something was wrong with your walk with God. If you didn't have a lot of money, something was wrong with your relationship with God. Remember Job's comforters, amen. They were just continually trying to batter him. What is it? Why, why did these things come upon you? What is it? Why is it? And, you know, he said, I haven't done anything that I know of, you know. And, and we know that um, Job was, did nothing. The Lord just allowed these things to come upon him. So in John chapter 9, verse 1, this is an example of that. Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? This was their mentality that they had. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Amen. Folks, I'm praying, and I know you all are too. I want the works of God to be manifested in my life. Amen. When I meet people on the street, I want to pray for them, and I want them to feel God. Amen. I want them to see something different about my life. Amen. But troubles that we come against, they bring revelation. It's the revelation that, yes, God is true. It's the proof that God is alive. He's doing something. And we really can't worship him, amen, without revelation. We don't worship and we can come and praise him, but true worship, I've already said it, you don't know like I know what he's done for me. It, it inspires us to come into the house of God and to worship him because we know what he has done for us. Hallelujah. And if we're not careful, though, this demonstration of the power of God, this divine demonstration, we can miss what God is trying to do in our lives, right? We can get discouraged. We can get uh, upset with God. We can get mad at the church and all these things if we're not careful. And somebody said that time is measured in minutes, but life is measured in the moment. Take every moment, whether good or bad, and take it to the Lord, amen, and let him speak to you. He's trying to do something in each and every one of our lives. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 12, he says, Wherefore, seeing that also we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run the race. So there's our problem. It's a, it's a race, right? In this world, you're going to have tribulations. Here, that theme again is just rolls around. We run with what? We run with patience. The race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one that we need to be looking to who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Amen. That's one thing about communion, and Tyler talked about it tonight. It helps us to remember Calvary. Helps us to remember what Jesus Christ did for us. He died for us. Amen. He went to the grave for us. He went down into hell. And he took the keys from the devil. Amen. The keys to death, hell, and the grave. That should be enough for us to all shout about that. Amen. That's what he has done for us. And we need to look upon him, lest we be wearied and faint in our minds. So Paul's acknowledging here, right, that we are going to go through some things, but just let's look unto Jesus. I don't have the answer, and the Bible doesn't really give any other answer than just lift your eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. You just keep looking towards the Lord. Amen. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood. In other words, you haven't died unto blood, striving against sin. 
and ye have forgotten the exhortation. He says, you've forgotten this, the expectation, the exhortation that speaketh unto you as children, God's children. Amen. We need to remind ourselves we are ch children of the Lord. Amen. We are God's children. He says, and my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God deal with you as with sons. For what son is he of whom the father chasteneth not? Which is simply disciplinary correction as in education or training. Amen. Applying the board of education to the seat of learning. You ever heard that saying before? That's what we need to do to our children. Apply the board of education to the seat of learning. Amen. But it's disciplinary correction that God gives us, and he calls us when we are, are able to endure the chastening, be patient in that. He says, you're my son. Hallelujah. He says, God dealeth with us as sons. Verse 11, now no chastening for the present time seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth. This is what it does for us. It yieldeth, it giveth back to us, it restoreth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. In other words, you're our child of God. Amen. Don't forget to take comfort or to take observation, if you will, in this special education because God is just drawing you closer to him. Amen. And always remember to praise him in the good times, in the bad times. Amen. <clears throat> if a little child is out there on the street and across the street he sees a playground, and all he sees is the prize, right? And he dashes forward, but the father's there, grabs his arm, pulls him back, gives him a little spanking, says, don't ever cross the street. The little boy doesn't quite understand but he doesn't see the danger of the cars that are on the road that he has to cross. So we don't always see what God sees, amen. As a matter of fact, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, amen, and my ways are not your ways. In personal conflict, when we're having that personal conflict, it's important for us to understand that there is always a greater lesson for us to learn. And we don't have to worry about it if we stay in the Lord. And to always remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual warfare sometimes. Amen. The enemy, and when you try to get close to God, the enemy tries to keep you from that too. So how big is our God tonight? We can't have it all figured out. We don't have it all figured out. If we did, we'd be God. Amen. One mistake or mishap in your life cannot mess everything up. Amen? Some people are just stuck in a past mistake, a past failure. Amen? That cannot mess anything up with the Lord. Nothing, the Bible says, can separate you from the love of God. Shall tribulation, not even tribulations, all things work together for the good to them that love God. Isaiah 40, 28, hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he fainteth not, neither is he weary, and there is no searching of his understanding. He give power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord, those that are patient in their situations, that wait upon the Lord, they will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. That's the experience that you're going to have when you just go through the troubles and you're going to mount up as a wings of the eagles. Hallelujah. You're going to run and you're not going to be weary. Hallelujah. You're going to walk and not faint. 
you're going to feel superhuman sometimes. Amen. You're on the you're on the mountaintop. Amen. Because you know that God has moved on your behalf. He's trying to mold us into his image to put on the mind of Christ the Bible admonishes us. When we look at 1 John and chapter number 1 it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 11 says, and he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He's given us the power to become the sons of God, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Amen. So he's given us power. So if we have power, then there's also uh, obviously something that we need to have power to over, right? So anything in your, in your way, you have been given power by Almighty God. If you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you're baptized in Jesus' name, you've got the power, amen, the Holy Ghost power. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. It was the revelation of God in the flesh. We beheld the revelation of God, this glory, this power of God. We beheld that in the flesh. Amen. And the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the Bible tells us, we read it at the beginning, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Romans chapter 1, 12, verse number 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So we just need to present our bodies. We need to come to the altar, amen, of sacrifice. We need to sacrifice these old bodies, amen, wholly acceptable unto God. It's our reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but ye be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that's what he wants. That's what he's trying for us to arrive to and to get to, the transformation of our thinking, amen. And you don't ever arrive to it. You don't ever are allowed to sit out there and say, well, I've arrived. I don't need to hear that, I, I've already transformed, given my life over to the Lord. God's always working on us. He's always transforming us by the renewing of our minds that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You want to know what the will of God is? Present your bodies to Him. Present yourself to Him. Say, Lord, I give it all unto you and be transformed by the renewing of your mind and you'll find the perfect will of God. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. He's already, now predestination doesn't mean that God already knows as an individual where they're going in their life. That's the predestination. But the destination for us has already been determined that we should become like his son, conformed into the image of his son, to line up to the word of God, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. Jesus was the image, right? He was the revelation of God to the world. And he says, we now need to be conformed to the image of the Son. This was his predetermined plan. That's why he says, the, you know, the, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. It's go, whatever God has determined, it's going to happen. Amen. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he also called. And whom he called, him he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glor glorified. What shall we then say of these things? If God be for us, who shall be against us? Amen.
Let me just close with this scripture in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath given us again unto the lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is our hope that Jesus rose again from the dead. He died for our sins, that we have the mercy of God, and that we also are going to be resurrected one day, that this mortal is going to take on immortality. Amen. We have this lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance, God's given us an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiable, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Heaven is real. Eternity is real. It's going to be worth the battle. It's going to be worth the fight. Amen. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and the glory and, the, and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now we, ye see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Whom you have not seen, you love. It's that hope that we have, right? It's that faith that we have. And that hope that we have comes through the troubles that work with patience, that gives us an experience, that work with hope. And the Bible says, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. You know, when you believe and you've not seen that God, God blesses that beyond measure. It was what Thomas, remember Thomas in that situation there where uh, Jesus appeared to his disciples and after his resurrection and Thomas wasn't there at that time. They said, we saw Jesus, he's back, he's resurrected. And Thomas said, lest I put my hands into his nail-scarred hands and feel the scars in his feet, th thrust my fist into his side. He said, I'm not going to believe. Amen. And when finally Jesus appeared back when Thomas was there, and he said, Thomas, come and see. And Thomas fell down at his feet, and he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus' response was, Thomas, because you've seen, you believe, but blessed are they that believe and have not yet seen. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Amen. That's the only thing that's important, folks, is the salvation of our souls. Amen. In our own particular lives. Amen. Let's all stand tonight. <clears throat> so just remember, God's just trying to mold us and to make us into what he wants us to be, which is really the image of Jesus Christ. That's why you need to stay in the word of God so you know what the Word says, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for your goodness and for your mercies. Help us, O oh Lord, I pray, to let us rejoice in all the trials and the tests that you have brought us from. God, you truly have done great things in our midst. We hold on to those things. It gives us new hope. God, we praise you, Lord, for what you're doing in these ending days. Help us to be a part of this end-time revival. God, we love you and praise you, and we believe in you. Help us to get our eyes off this old world. Help us to get our eyes off our own situations and realize that there's a lost and dying world out there. Lord, we love you and praise you. We give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all God's people say amen.